Good morning. This is Meg Riley here in rainy Minneapolis with another episode of The View. Um, Asia Hauser is with her daughter in Walla Walla and won't be with us today, but how about the rest of us introducing ourselves? I'll we'll start with the regulars and then move to our special guest. Michael. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino uh, joining you as usual from Peekskill, New York. Um, if you notice the background is a little different, I'm down in the dining room today just because uh, we are having my house insulated, uh, hopefully to use less energy this winter. And uh, other than that, it's, it's a good day here. Christina, how are you? Hi, everybody. Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. We are finally having beautiful weather clearing out after the hurricane, um, but all of the church doors are swollen, almost shut. Uh, we just have not had a, a, a let up of the humidity here, and uh, pretty soon we're, we're either, either not going to be able to get out or get into church, one or the other. That is a frightening idea. <laughs> Uh, on tech, we have Jessica Star Rockers. Jess? The, hi, Jessica here from Seattle. Um, yeah, I am on Twitter, hashtag The View. I'm on Facebook looking at your comments. And I'm going to the MFC next week, which means my brain right now is a little bit like Swiss cheese and is very confused. So be patient with me today. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm happy to be here. And we wish you well, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, I think next week we'll have somebody else doing tech as you will be on the road. So our thoughts will be with you and everybody who is going to the MFC this time, including the panel members who work really hard. So um, yeah, best, best wishes to all there. Well, I'm going to jump right in because I'm really excited about our guest today. Um, we have Dr. Takia Noor Amin, who has been here before as a collective member from the Blue Collective, and she's now the content director for Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. Welcome, Takia. Howdy, howdy. Happy to be with you in now, what is a beautiful day in Charlotte, North Carolina. How is Charlotte following all the storms? Charlotte is actually okay. You know, we're very far inland. Right. Um, so we did not get the brunt of Hurricane Florence. We did have some very high winds, some significant rain, and there are parts of the city that experienced significant flooding. But for the most part, we're doing well and coordinating efforts to support communities that are closer to the coast that have sustained significant um, you know, damage and will need some long-term support, particularly in areas like New Bern, North Carolina. Thank you. Yeah, I saw the pictures of the flooded streets in Charlotte and you're all the way over, I mean, hundreds of miles from the coast. That was... Yeah, there are, I mean, there are parts of the city that are more or less prone to flooding. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky that where I am, we didn't have any of those issues. I didn't even lose power, though there are certainly pockets of the city that did. So mm -hmm. we certainly fared better than huge swaths of the rest of the state. And so we're trying to use what resources we have to be supportive to others in need. That's great. Thank you. Well, tell me, what does the content director at Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism do? A whole lot. <laughs> I actually have um, about six areas that I work on that I was already very active in as a member of the organizing collective. I've been volunteering with Blue for almost two years now. Um, or a little over two years now. And the content director basically oversees content related to um, several project areas, ranging from our pastoral care work to some of the faith development projects we're working on. Um, the content that'll be coming out in the project we'll be discussing today, the blue box. Um, I either create or curate content for blue. So, Anything that you see coming forward from the Blue Organizing Collective, as long as I'm here as, as our CD, will either be work that I have directly put together or curated on behalf of the team. That's really exciting since it's you have a mm -hmm. It is, I mean, as people will know who have ever seen me 
when Dickie is a guest, I get so excited by your ideas. So to think of you um, in the role that you're in, just when I saw it, I just got a huge grin thinking uh, you are so a uh, combination, my favorite combination of people, practical and visionary, you know, and, and so how wonderful that you can put some of this into action. So tell us about something you alluded to, the blue box. Yes. So um, one of our newest projects with actually, Black Lives of UU. If, if I can interrupt, because some folks actually may not know what Black Lives of UU is. Oh, good okay. point. Good oh, point. Good point. Just, okay. Just, just let, them, let them know how fabulous you all are. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for that. So Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism known affectionately at, as Blue, um, came together in 2015. We are a group of five folks who organize on behalf of and for Black Unitarian Universalists. You can learn more about us and our work at www.blacklivesuu.com. It'll give you information on our work up to this point, current projects, links to all our social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, so you can follow us in all of those places. Um, in terms of sort of the areas that we work in, I think it's critical for people to understand that Blue is really focused on three things. One is expanding the power and capacity of Black Unitarian Universalists within our shared faith tradition providing support information and resources for Black UUs, and what we call justice making and liberation through our faith, really ensuring that any social justice work we do is grounded and shaped by um, our living tradition. And, and we I'll have just, fun too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add that Jess has put the links up. Um, so Takiya, there's a website, a Facebook page. What else did you say, Instagram? Instagram, Twitter, yep, you can Twitter, find us in all those places, yep. There, that's great. Okay, so given that, which is very exciting and has been going on for a while and you've done a lot of amazing stuff, this is a new project, this blue box. Yeah, so, so we are super excited to be launching a subscription box, the blue spiritual subscription box, which we affectionately refer to as the blue box. I have to say, um, I just got to see images recently from our comrade, Leslie Mack, who actually designed the physical box that people will be getting in the mail. And it is gorgeous. Let me just tell you, if you've not yet signed up for a subscription, um, it is worth it just to get this beautiful little box in the mail. But the blue box is something that we came up with to create a one-of-a-kind innovative way for people to inform, grow, and deepen their faith. We wanted to create an opportunity for people to be able to engage content that's grounded in the lived experiences of Black Unitarian Universalists. Um, and we wanted to provide folks with an ongoing opportunity for faith development um, whether they're doing that in their homes, with their families, whether it's a group of friends gathering, small group ministries, really wanted to provide a resource to support that um, piece of our faith work and organizing. Almost since the very beginning of Blue, people have been asking for additional resources. You know, can you, can you give us something to read? Can you give us something to feed our faith on a regular basis? We want more access to your ministry. We need more resources from Blue. And um, it's been important to us as we continue um, developing as an organizing collective, it's been increasingly clear to us that a lot of people don't get access in congregational contexts to sort of a perspective on Unitarian Universalism that's grounded in the diverse lived experiences of Black people or an awareness of the ways in which Black people have contributed to Unitarianism, Universalism, and Unitarian Universalism. Um, I know many congregations do a good job of providing a UU 101 kind of overview, 101, 102, when people join congregations. But in most of the research that we've done, there's very little that's offered that really centers Black-led perspective. And our belief is that 
you know, a Black Unitarian Universalist theology, Black Unitarian Universalist perspective is useful not only for Black people, but for all Unitarian Universalists and folks who we call UU adjacent, who are interested in liberation theologies and activist theologies. So, yeah. yeah. So these subscriptions are available to people for people of all races and the exactly. materials are geared for anybody who wants to access mm -hmm. Black centered mm -hmm. Unitarian Universalism. Yeah, one of the, you know, sort of hashtags that we've been using is blue box is for everyone. And we really thought through how to curate the box in that way. We did think about certain folks who it might be a fit for. We know that there are lots of Black UUs who are isolated. Um, we talk to people a lot of time for whom not only Black people in their congregation might be them and their family, them and their immediate family, or them and their children. So if you are an isolated Black UU who's looking for a community and consistent spiritual development, if you are a non-Black person of color or a white UU and you are looking for Black-led spiritual content and analysis around contemporary issues, maybe you're not UU at all but you are looking to deepen your spiritual life and ground and inform your justice work. And maybe you want to continue to support the work that Blue is doing. People have asked for ways to materially support the work that Blue is doing, and this is a great way to do it. And so people go to the website to find out how to subscribe there? Absolutely. If you go to blacklivesuu.com, the homepage right now provides all the information on the blue box. We have a very detailed blue box FAQ of frequently asked questions that people can scroll through. The information to subscribe is also there. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is that um, we worked to create sample content. So if you're interested in getting a taste of what you would be receiving in the box each month, you can download sample content to kind of explore right now and even use and you know incorporating your own spiritual practice just to get a sense of the kind of information and resources that people will have um, going forward. Now, of course, Leslie Mack, who has been involved with um, Blue for, uh, from the very beginning, ran uh -huh. the highly successful safety pin box after yes. the election. And is I had to wonder if that was part of the genesis of this and what your hopes are as this um, takes off. Sure. I mean, one of the great things about Leslie's experience with Safety Pinbox is that she's really aware of the logistical needs um, and the details around running a successful subscription service. And as we were thinking about how do we get this ministry into people's hands? Mm -hmm. How do we get resources to the people? How do we get you know, what people need to them directly? The idea of doing a box was not something that I'd come up with, but when the topic sort of bubbled up to the table, because Leslie had had all of that direct experience, she sort of wasn't afraid of it and was really able to help guide us through thinking about the details of organizing a box like this and what sort of deadlines we'd have to have internally um, in order to make that happen. There's also, I think, just that uh, subscription services are not only timely, you know, you can find a subscription service for just about anything. I mean, they're kind of like podcasts in that way, whatever you're interested in, somebody somewhere is doing a podcast about it, even if they only have, you know, 10 people listening, somebody's doing a podcast on that. And so you can find subscription services for lots of different things. But one thing that we noticed in researching for this project is that there are lots of spiritual subscription services available, but we found virtually none that were black led, very few that are centering the voices of people of color at all. And most of those subscription services are also grounded in a singular faith tradition. So if you are um, coming from an interfaith perspective or a multi-faith perspective, um, Unitarian Universalism being grounded and informed by six sources, there really wasn't anything that sat at that intersection of black theological thinking and a broad and diverse faith perspective. So we're entering you know, the market, so to speak, at a really interesting and necessary place that will allow us hopefully to um, generate some good operating funds to support Blue's growing independence as at the same time that we're meeting the needs of people in our faith community. 
it's the kind of thing I have to say, it's the kind of thing that if I didn't have anything to do with it at all, I'd still really want it. <laughs> like if I saw this, I'd be, I'd be really excited about getting it. And that's how a lot of my work with blue has been. It's been, you know, we'll be developing something and I think to myself, Oh, I want to be a part of that. Yep. And then I have to go, wait a minute. I am, or wait a minute. I get to be a part of crafting this. So that's been very exciting. And I think that that portion of it um, that you kind of touched on at the, the end of that is um, what I've seen a little bit more broadly in work from Blue is this kind of idea of UU adjacent of that. Um, and we, you know, I've long thought, you know, the our organizing work, our social justice movement spaces so often are um, searching and yearning for spiritual sustenance to, to be able to continue to do the work. And so often our mainline churches um, cannot provide that for a variety of reasons. Um, and that we are, as you use, uniquely positioned um, to provide some of that. And, and so it's really, to me, what's one of the things that's really interesting about the box and about how you all are kind of positioning it is that um, I think what you're saying, you, you adjacent is, you know, really trying to let folks know um, even within you, you context, like you may know somebody who's not you, you that would love this box. Right. And as long as you have a mailing address for them, you can even sponsor a box for them if you'd like to um, and have it sent directly to them. One of the things to your point is that when Blue has been on the ground organizing, we run into people all the time in organizing space who articulate a, a real strong desire for spiritual community. A lot of the people who we um, connect with on the ground um, may have been ostracized out of more mainstream um, faith traditions, um, often because of their identity or because of their justice making work. So we run into people who identify as LGBTQ and for that reason have not felt at home within a particular faith community. Um, or we run into people who um, didn't feel ostracized from faith community because of their identity, but found that their commitment to social justice, to activism, to organizing work was unwelcome in their faith community. That doesn't mean that they don't have a spirituality. That doesn't mean that they don't have a spiritual perspective, but it's been hard for them to find and secure a home, a spiritual home. And from the beginning, Blue has been open and welcoming to folks who are UU adjacent in that way. I will say that one of our um, sadnesses has been that um, a lot of the folks we interact with on the ground don't know anything about Unitarian Universalism. Or if they do, they've largely had negative experiences or negative interactions with white UUs or in trying to attend predominantly white congregations. I can't tell you how many times Blue has been out in organizing space and when people find out that we're Unitarian Universalists, they're very surprised. Um, oh my goodness, there are Black UUs and y'all are happy there? Wait a minute. You know, how are you making a home in this faith? So part of um, sort of the ministry of Blue Box is also a way to articulate not only our commitment to Unitarian Universalism, but to share it in a way um, that certainly doesn't feel like we're proselytizing or being pushy, but sharing what gives our lives value and meaning. And y'all know me, I'm a rather evangelical Unitarian Universalist. So I'm happy to talk about my faith and what gives my life meaning with people all day. But you know, I do feel like um, our larger tradition has not the best PR sometimes. And there is um, some hope that the box will help to shift that a little bit. So Michael Slack is um, visiting and says hi, but that makes me wonder, you mentioned pastoral care mm -hmm. and you just lifted up one pastoral care issue, which certainly a lot of people of color speak about, which is actually spiritual harm that happens in our congregations. But uh, are those largely the kinds of pastoral care issues that you're involved with? Or how would you describe what you're doing with pastoral care? 
Well, I will say, you know, we, after hosting the um, convening for Black Unitarian Universalists in March, 2017, we conducted a survey of Black UUs and released the findings some weeks back. You can find that information on our website as well as our Facebook page and our Medium page. Um, there were three things that sort of came up consistently in the survey. Um, lots of Black UUs are dealing with some frustration as it relates to you know, sort of congregational life, right? I mean, the reality is that most UU congregation, congregations are predominantly white institutions that are, it's not just about the presence of white people as much as it is that these institutions are grounded in white dominant culture and norms as their foundation, right? So these congregations were never established for black people, by, by black people or with our very diverse cultural norms and needs at a consideration to begin with. Um, along those lines as well, when it comes to matters of worship, there is a real strong desire for more soul enriching music and worship. That's a very particular and specific longing that we hear from Black UUs as well as Black folks who are drawn to Unitarian Universalism and maybe have gone to a few worships and they love the ideas, but there's something about the way the worship feels that's really uncomfortable. And the truth is, it's been difficult for Black folks, many Black folks to find that soul enriching worship when the folks who are in charge of that at the congregational level lack familiarity with or have respect for the broad range of Black religious aesthetics and worship traditions and rituals and practices that connect us across a wide range of faith traditions and perspectives that Black people occupy. Right. I've heard people sort of be flippant and assume that, you know, well, black people don't like Unitarian Universalism because they need Jesus. It's like, well, not every black unit, you, you or you, you adjacent person is Christian or, you know, longing for that particular experience. Some of us are humanist. Some of us are atheist in our outlook. But there is a desire for something that centers our cultural aesthetics as it relates to worship and also um, people highlighted in the survey a lack of what they perceive to be a lived out investment in the theological diversity that UU congregations espouse, right? That while if you read about our communities on paper, there's a really strong sense that we are an elastic uh, faith community that can wrap around lots of different perspectives. But when people don't find that to be a living reality in congregational context, that's a real letdown, particularly for those who are coming from an interfaith background or a multi-faith family who are trying to make a home in Unitarian Universalism. So on the pastoral care front, in addition to this sort of direct ministry that we're trying to provide through the Blue Box, Blue launched what we call Blue Men, our Blue Ministerial Network which provides pastoral care for Black UUs. People can connect with Blue Men online, by phone. Um, we, can, we have a phone number that people can access for that. If they need a pastoral care conversation, we have Black ministers as well as lay persons who have been staffing that line and providing pastoral care for people as needed. Um, we have also recently moved to two worship services online every month that we do that are explicitly black worship. Um, so the soul enriching music and worship that people are looking for and the cultural aesthetics that perhaps they'd like to highlight are centered in that. We also have one of my favorite things that I affectionately refer to as BAM, which is our blue affirmations ministry, which anyone can sign up for where every day at 11 a.m. Eastern, you will get a daily affirmation from Blue sent to your phone. Um, there are some other offerings as well, but being able to really um, find ways to meet those unmet pastoral and spiritual needs has been a real joy. And I do have to shout out um, our wonderful minister, the Reverend Michael Slack, who really oversees so much of that work and who I'm thrilled to be in community with. I'm sorry, I realized that was a lot of talking, but these are really big issues that Blue has done our best to try to figure out how to organize around so that we can do the best work we can for the largest number of people we can serve.
And I should say that one of the things we've noticed with the pastoral care piece with Black Unitarian Universalists is that whenever things are happening in our larger society that are causing pain and confusion, whether that has to do with a particular political decision or the return of the church year that many of us are experiencing right now, or even the disaster issues related to Hurricane Florence, all of those moments are when we experience an uptick in people asking for pastoral support. Well, I think I, if you look at our faces, we're all really excited to hear what you're saying. I don't see anybody's face saying, all right, already. Um, can people subscribe to the affirm the BAM and everything by again by going to the website? Is that the best way mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah, if mm -hmm. you go to blacklivesuu.com, everything is there. You'll be able to link directly to Bloomin and learn about all of our offerings. Um, one of the exciting features we have with Bloomin as well with, through the Blue Ministerial Network is that you can actually, if you are a Black Unitarian Universalist, and let's say you've just moved to a new community or you're traveling and you'd like an opportunity connect, to connect with other Black UUs, there's a Google form you can fill out that will come directly to us and we will make sure to connect you with other Black UUs who we know are in that area because that sense of community is really important. So many Black UUs have articulated the frustration of not wanting to feel like they have to choose. You know, either I'm Black or I'm a, or I'm a Unitarian Universalist, particularly when there are moments of crisis. I know that when bad, painful, hurtful things happen in the world, I'm often looking for community and relationship. But it can be hard if I'm with Black people who don't understand my particular faith perspective as a UU. And I'm in pain at that moment, so I don't necessarily want to explain my, my, my faith at that time. Or I'm in community with Unitarian Universalists who don't understand my particular experience as a Black woman living in the world. And when I'm in pain or experiencing grief, that's not the moment when I want to necessarily have to explain all of that. So being able to create community for people, especially right at that intersection of both um, sort of cultural heritage and faith identity has been uh, increasingly important in the work that we do. Makes me think of that old 80s book, all the blacks are men, all the women are white, but some of us are brave. <laughs> so you're, you're dealing with that same kind of identity, um, intersectionality and complexity that yeah. yeah, interesting. And one of the things that I like to say is when people ask me about Blue is that we are you know, decidedly Unitarian Universalist and unapologetically Black. We're not going anywhere. Um, this is our faith. This is our faith tradition. This is our faith community. Um, I grew up in a multi-faith family. My parents are Muslim. My grandparents are Christian. And part of the reason why I um, love and appreciate Unitarian Universalism is because it is a faith community that allows me to bring the best of both of those traditions with me. Um, I don't have to disown my mother's faith to be here. I don't have to disown the best of my grandmother's faith to be here. And that's very important because so much of that has made me who I am. And it's been a real joy to find um, a faith home in Unitarian Universalism in that way. All the more frustrating than when I have felt particularly ostracized um, because of my Black working class identity. And so one of the things that Blue is committed to doing is really sitting at that intersection to make sure that um, folks like me and maybe folks unlike me who identify as Black Unitarian Universalists will have a real home in this faith because we feel like it's important and um, we have a right to be here and we've been here for many, many years. So it's very exciting work to be doing. Well, it's important to have a, a, a space where it's really explicit that you don't have to disown your blackness to be here, right? So we, you know, we, we're really explicit about you not having to disown your, your, your theological diversity um and we and we fail so so often um with with unitarian universalists of color uh, i think i think you know to your point about that michael i think part of it too is that 
um, when people have been sort of critical of blue, you know, everybody in the world is not happy that we exist or thrilled about the work that we're doing. That's been a reality since blue's inception in 2015. Um, one of the things that I, 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 I feel the need to lift up here is sometimes it's like the presence of white people is seen as evidence that something is inclusive. No, I just don't think blue's inclusive enough. You know, why don't you have, you know, more spaces where, and usually this is a white person, you know, why don't you have more spaces where I can be present? It's typically, you know, the because critique. there are so few people, places where white people can be in the so world. So few places for white people to be in the world. Good God. But I think what people miss is that blackness is already diverse. Blackness is always already diverse. And the communities that we create, you know, in blue, we say all black lives matter. All black lives matter. So we're talking about young folks, we're talking about elder folks, we're talking about our trans siblings, we're talking about we're talking about our folks across class, we're talking about our community across the diaspora. We already have our own diversity and issues around inclusion whether anybody else is in the room or not. And so having spaces for us to work through that together as a community is as important and perhaps even more so than being in other spaces where those needs are not at the center. So really pushing back on this idea that, oh, well, if it's quote, as people will say, if it's just black, it's somehow not diverse or not inclusive. And that's certainly not true. This might seem like a random question, but I I just find myself wondering it. So you have a PhD in dance theory, right? Do I have that right? How do you find that helpful? What you know about dance, how does that come into the work you do now? That's an excellent question. I think for me, um, one of the things that I love about dance is that dance is one of the few activities that all human communities engage. We have yet to find a group of human beings on the planet for whom there is not something we would understand as human movement in time and space expressed with creativity and intention. Um, dance is older than written language. Dance is older than codified speech. Um, the impulse to communicate ideas through the body is a fundamentally human reality. Um, and I am moved that as a scholar and researcher, I get to engage with something that is so fundamental to what it is to be human. You know, art making is one of the things that separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. We create this stuff called art, right? We have these creative and expressive impulses that are fundamentally human. And I think there's something about the core of that for me, which is deeply spiritual. Um, I am a UU who is rather theistic in my outlook. And so I think of the natural world as being the creative expression of whatever put us here. You know, some people might call it God or spirit or have other language for it. But when I am looking at sunlight or butterflies or running water or other people, I understand that to be the spirit of life expressing itself as in, in all of its complexity and diversity. And there's something about that as it relates to dance as a fundamental human activity for me that allows this work I'm doing with Blue, even though it is different, not necessarily to feel separate from the other work that I get to do in the world as a thinker and as an intellectual. I hope that wasn't too heady and strange. I loved it. I loved it. I, was, I, I felt it. I felt a jolt there. <laughs> Where do you think, I, I know Blue is, oh, Christina, go ahead. Oh, I was just, um, one of the things that Blue has done so successfully, you know, in the past couple of years has been um, actually having gatherings of Black UUs. And I know that that is always a question for folks of, you know, when is the next time they're having something of getting people together? Um, and I know that that has been an evolving um, 
thing for blues. I just wondered if if you could speak a little bit towards that. At the risk of getting in trouble with the rest of the team, <laughs> I, will not, I will not reveal all of our plans. I can hear <laughs> Kay Gardner, our executive director, saying, Takia, don't tell <laughs> them. But I think it's okay for me to share that there will likely be another opportunity for us to gather as community in the fall of 2019. Yeah. Have you all thought about, because I think you talked about this in a past show before you, you were the CD. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe you didn't, and I imagined it, but um, getting a UU camper conference center or someone like that to do some of the hosting because those gatherings are so labor intensive and there are UU organizations set up just to host people. Has, has anybody reached out to you or are you in conversations with anyone about that? You know, what? You, you know what, yes, we have, especially as we think about building out um, more opportunities for engagement for youth and young adults. One of the challenges though, is that our camps and conference centers are not necessarily the easiest places to get to, right? They're built in that, you know, most of them are in these far flung, because again, the concern was not, oh, we need to build some spaces that are gonna be comfortable and accessible for people of color. That wasn't necessarily the thinking, right? So they're not necessarily in places that are um, always desirable or attractive or easiest to get to, but it is definitely on our radar. Um, one of the things we've heard, particularly from you, from Black UU parents, is a desire for their young people to be able to experience the culture of uh, cons, which we know are a big thing in Unitarian Universalism and wanting them to have more opportunities to engage in that way, but having really deep concerns about their baby being sort of, as my mother would say, you know, I don't want to send you somewhere where you're going to be the only chocolate drop in the room. So as we continue building that workout over the next year, we are absolutely thinking about how we might partner with um, the camps and conference centers to um, create some space for Black UU youth and young adults, especially to be able to gather as community. I mean, if I, and I'll be 40 next year, had, can relate to experiencing isolation as a Black UU, I can't imagine what that feels like at 17 or 18, you know, or 15, what that isolation might do to a young person. So it's definitely on our radar, yeah. I know, Christina, this is a, a matter close to your heart, Christina's son being the new dean? No. Uh, anyway, I, but anyway. Yeah, youth caucus dean. Youth caucus dean, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and it's definitely something that, you know, even within the youth of color community, um, you know, youth are talking about of just, you know, the struggle of, you know, thank God for social media. Um, to be able to connect uh, across time and space, but that, that just doesn't um, replace the actual in-person being able to make connection and how special that is for them. And, and also some, some wistfulness for what they understand as having happened in the past. Um, when um, you know communities of color were differently resourced um, within Unitarian Universalism and had the ability to gather together. Um, and so certainly wholeheartedly support um, Blue's, Blue's ability to bring together Black um, youth. And uh, it's just so important in not just their faith development, which is of course important, but their um, identity development. Um, so. I will say that when we conducted our survey of Black UUs, while we did get some youth engagement, um, we did not get nearly as much as we would have liked from sort of the two ends of the spectrum. So wanting to hear more from youth and young adults and wanting to hear more from elders, sort of the over, 55 crowd that may or may not be involved on social media where we do a lot of our organizing and engagement. Um, so part of it was a real challenge. So part of what we're doing going forward will be creating more opportunities for not only face-to-face -face gathering, but for people to um, be able to engage this ministry locally, you know, thinking about how we can build out 
more opportunities for people to experience blue in a local setting and have more regional engagement and support as we push to um, sort of organizational independence. When Blue was founded in 2015, part of our agreement with the UUA was that we would have sort of five years to develop before we had to have a structure and a board and move forward. And time moves quickly, 2020 will shortly be upon us. So all of this stuff is on our radar right now. And I've had to explain to people that Blue is sort of like a duck that you might see on the water where things look very calm or even quiet you know what's blue doing i haven't heard from them but the feet underneath are paddling ferociously that's that certainly characterizes the work from time to time and and i think that's really important to highlight to Kia because i think folks have this this idea that somehow um it is super easy to create not just something new but something that follows a different way of being um, and that that is not easy to do and and nor should it be and that you have to allow room for the holy and, <laughs> and allow room for mistakes and allow room for learning um Look, and, and I, just room for life just room yeah. for life yeah you know, when i tell people you know when we've gone out into organizing space for people who are familiar with blue they always assume that it's more of us on the organizing collective than there are you know so what is it about 15 or 20 of you it's like no you know at most there's six been six of us um i also think people don't realize that we are just ordinary people with with bills and pain and lives you know, we've experienced family death and illness and job upheavals and, you know, everything that everybody else goes through um, at the same time that we're trying to develop something needed and revolutionary. The one thing I will say that has kept us in the work is that the work is highly relational. I've worked in lots of different contexts and I've never worked in a situation like the one with the Blue Organizing Collective where um, people are genuinely concerned, not just about my productivity, but about my well-being, or where people are not concerned about whether or not I produced the Google document, but they're concerned about my pastoral needs in a real way. Um, that has definitely, I think, kept us grounded and centered in the work and also things will happen in the world to remind us of how important this ministry is. Um, with the return to the church year, um, in the blue closed Facebook group, we actually had lots of black UUs posting about how frustrating it was to go back to church a couple of weeks ago. Um, the comments that people experienced, the misappropriation of black sacred music um, being put into uh, a service where the music was sort of decontextualized and appropriated, um, hearing the uh, misappropriation of words by black civil rights leaders in a service, um, even a service where the N word was used. Um, these are the things that black you use experience when they come back to church, you know, water communion, is something that marks the beginning of the year for a lot of us. And people were really excited and looking forward to getting back to congregational life. And then you go and you have this experience and it's like running at top speed into a brick wall. And sadly, those kinds of testimonies remind us of how important it is that we continue doing this work. So when we have doubts or we get tired, usually there's something happening in our own community that reminds us of how necessary this work really is. And, and I think, I mean, I can't overemphasize that point enough um, about how necessary and how life-saving um, the ministry of Blue is. Um, because I think folks, sometimes I think people get, you know, kind of esoteric about it and, oh, it's to support people of color. No, it's, supposed to, it's for Black Unitarian Universalists. And, and I think that they lose sight of that this was born out of a need, out of a deep 
love for our faith and need to support Black Unitarian Universalists, because that was not being met, right? That it wasn't just something that that people, you know, thought somebody else was doing. It wasn't even, it wasn't being done. And and I I think folks sometimes, you know, as we get further away from the inception of Blue, um, I think people sometimes lose sight and, and they just start thinking of it as just this, you know, other umbrella organization. And and I, to me, it's so important when I'm talking with folks about Blue to really reflect back to them um, about the ministry of Blue and, and the the reason why it exists. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you so much for lifting that up. And, you know, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, one of the critiques has been this assumption that those of us who work on the organizing collective just sort of threw Blue together so that we could, quote, make a name for ourselves in the faith, which <laughs> um, has been, you know, sort of an oft repeated, rather spurious and inaccurate critique. Um, I have a name, I have a name already. I have a name in the scholarly world, you know, the people to whom I want to be known, I am known. So this was not sort of a star vehicle for myself or for anyone else. You know, everybody was already busy <laughs> in their life. Um, um, not only trying to tend to their own spiritual needs in some way, but, you know, doing other work in the world. It would be easier not to do this. It would be much easier to give blue up or to um, say, well, we tried it, but it's really hard, so we're quitting. Um, but our commitment to this work is much deeper than that. Um, I hesitate because I also find that it's common in UU space for people to sort of trot out what I call their UU bona fides. You know, I've been in the faith for this number of years and I was on this committee and I went there to study and, I, and really that shouldn't matter. I think what should matter is the depth of profession and commitment of this faith. I think your testimony as a Unitarian Universalist matters, whether it's been for five minutes or five years or 50 years. Um, but all of us have been committed Unitarian Universalists for a long time, a very long time. And we, part of how we can do this work is because we love this faith and know it intimately, um, almost as intimately as we know our own pain and frustration as Black people in this faith. Right, So we're coming at this work out of that love for Unitarian Universalism and commitment to meeting the needs of others who like ourselves have felt marginalized or ostracized within our living tradition. Not because anybody is trying to be a celebrity <laughs> or a superstar. Um, I'm sure there are easier ways to do that. I could be, I don't know, I could go become a Kardashian or something, but choosing to organize on behalf of black people in a predominantly white liberal faith community is not what you do if being a superstar is your ultimate goal. <laughs> no, not at all. It's it's what you do when you love when you love your faith and you love the people that you're in relationship with in your faith. And um, so I'm so thankful to hear your testimony on that because I think people forget, you know, they, they, we are so quick to idolatry, idolatry, whatever the word is in Unitarian Universalism and to hold up as, you know, perfect models and to hold up, you know, the new and shiny thing. And I think that, that folks forget that, that these are people um, who are, are in it and in it deeply and, you know, love Unitarian Universalism. And, um, and I have to say that the model we're creating, one of the things we know is that there's a level at which we're only going to understand it in hindsight, right? Um, sometimes we've managed to do things where the synergy and clarity has been so spot on, but usually we don't figure that out until after we've done it. Oh, it really did make sense to do this in that order write that down so we can do it again. Or 
oh, it really did make sense to cultivate these relationships in a particular way. So now we can call on those partnerships. Somebody put that in the notes. I mean, you know, we are living into this work. And as our executive director, uh, Lena K. Gardner likes to remind us, you know, it's very difficult and virtually impossible to fly a plane while you're building it. And yet that's what we're doing. And so that means that we make mistakes. It means that it's challenging. It means that the work isn't perfect, but the key is we are committed to staying in it. And I should say too, we don't always agree on every single thing. You know, we're not, you know, the, the mythical three witches sitting around passing the glass eye back and forth. <laughs> you know, we say all the time that consensus is not community. The difference is just because I might disagree with something doesn't mean that I'm taking my toys and my resources and I'm going home. And a lot of us have experienced that in other organizing communities where a group of people decide they don't like the direction that the majority wants to go in. And so they decide to withdraw. Um, I am very vocal and effusive when I like something. Um, I am equally vocal and effusive when I don't. So if I'm displeased, I'm going to know, you're going to know, the whole wide world's going to know. But that doesn't mean that I then pick myself up and leave the community or leave the work. And that's been true for all of us. We will, we will be vocal and we will be bold and we will be clear and say, I don't know about this guys, or these are my concerns, or these are my reservations, or here's you know, what's on my heart about this. But that doesn't mean that we're withdrawing from each other. And having that as sort of a, um, a principle that undergirds our work together has been really, really important to holding us in this work. And it's a really, really important principle in holding us in Unitarian Universalism work in general um, that, that we really, I think, could um, revisit <laughs> and not be in danger of, uh, of going over territory that is well-tread. I think uh, in UU, we see a lot of folks who are just like, it's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And it would be, it, it's one of the reasons why we're like, you know what, we need to decenter whiteness because yeah. that is such a, a central focus of either or thinking. Right. And as soon as we decenter that, we get into a whole host of other possibilities for our faith that, that is beautiful. I will say that if you go to the Black Lives UU website and you scroll down to the bottom, there's a link to our working agreements. Um, we spent a very long time thinking through our working agreements and as an organizing collective and how we would covenant to work together. And once we really got clear on what that should be and look like and all of us were able to coalesce around it and sign off on them, we thought, well, maybe this is something we should share publicly too that other people might wanna to use to inform their organizing or their covenant or gathering work. So that's just another little piece if people are interested in it. Blue's working agreements are available to you as a model so that you can understand how we live into this work and what we hold each other to in terms of responsibility in the work. You know, it just uh, as, as you're describing the way you work together, it occurs to me that what you're describing is how covenant is supposed to work, right? So, <laughs> you know, if this is the foundation of our faith as Unitarian Universalism, um, you you are trying really hard to to do covenant um, the way it's supposed to work, and um, that really should be a model for all of us, whatever our racial background. I mean, and it's, and, and, you know, to Michael, to your point, and it's not easy sometimes um, to hold yourself accountable to those covenants, but without it, what do we have? I mean, it really is the way for us, it's the floor. It's the floor that really grounds our working together. And again, you know, as I've said before, where you use, I mean, this is, you know, we're talking about justice making and liberation through our faith, through our faith. For us, it's not that our faith is over here on the left side and our organizing and justice work is on the right. 
for us, these things exist together. I mean, even when we gather in blue worship, we talk about, you know, worship is a, it's a way of being in the world. It's not a thing that you gather to do. It's an embodied living reality. So yeah, it's, it's challenging. I've had people say to me, well, being a UU must be easy because it's not a religion that calls you to change. And I'm like, I don't know who you're talking to because <laughs> I have found being a Unitarian Universalist um, deeply challenging in terms of holding me to an aspirational standard around how I interact with people. When it would be so easy to just cut people off or to be petty or dismissive or to cuss somebody out. Um, Unitarian Universalism calls me to move through that in a really, really serious way. So yeah, we're trying to live into covenant and it's not easy, but it's what keeps us able to do the work we're doing. I, I found that um, doing Unitarian Universalist bad, Unitarian Universalism badly is easy, um, right? Doing, doing Unitarian Universalism well is hard. It's all the things that you're talking about. It's, it's coming back to relationship again and again and again um, when things get difficult. Um, it's, it's calling us to accountability. Um, you know, we can, you know, we can do it badly. And that's yeah. easy. We've done it badly <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the issues too is that like many Unitarian Universalists, what we found is that lots of Black UUs are coming into our living tradition from other faith perspectives, right? Um, that's, that's true for lots of Unitarian Universalists. But one of the problems that they've lifted up to us as we continue building out the work that Blue does is, you know, you can't define something by what it isn't, right? This is Michael, I'm Takia. We don't call him not Takia. We call him Michael, right? And sometimes I think Unitarian Universalism in its desire to be a welcoming, loving, warm place for everybody gets drowned in this kind of wishy-washy, mealy-mouthed, we're not gonna be like those people you left, we promise. We won't be like the faith community you left, but people need more than that in order to live into something. Telling me what you aren't going to be or not going to do is not nearly as powerful as making a bold, clear, prophetic statement about what you believe, what you value, and how you're trying to live those principles out in the world. And in a time like this, socially, culturally, politically, that's what people are hungry for. People want bold, clear, prophetic, accessible messaging that they can hang their hat on. And we're trying as much as we can to do that with and through our work with Blue. Well, Dr. Amin, your bold, clear, prophetic <laughs> presence here has been great. I always, I always leave my time with you feeling ministered to and ready to go. So I love that you're bringing that to Blue and to, to the work that you're doing. And clearly you've found your calling and it's wonderful. And Thanks to the whole collective for I, what I know is really incredibly challenging and hard work that's, as you say, requires a persistence and a devotion that, that's uplifting to the whole faith, I feel. Um, so we are at the end of our time. Next week, we're going to have Reverend Jalen Scott coming on to talk about trans faith and faith formation. So I'm excited about that. Dr. Amin, you're welcome back anytime. So come and see us again. Thank you. I really appreciate you all letting me be here with you. And I enjoyed it. <laughs>